Okay, so Queen of Ice is about Didda, uh, who ruled Kashmir in the 10th century for around 50 years. And her story is remarkable, not just because she was a woman who ruled on uh, the throne as formal ruler for such a long time, but also because she was lame and she, she had a deformed foot. She couldn't move on her own, so she needed to be carried around from place to place. And despite that, she was um, such a strong ruler that she gave Kashmir a period of peace and prosperity that it never saw before or since. So this book has been published by Duckbill and it's for young adults primarily, so, but it could be read by, you know, um, adults as well or advanced readers who are younger than that age. Uh, okay, so Didda was part of my doctoral research, uh, which was on uh, women in the early medieval period in North India and uncovering spaces for them because the writing of history is male-centered. So most women have been made invisible in the historical narrative. So why I decided to write this book is because uh, the history that students read in school is his story. It has very little to do with the women in the past. And typically, um, the textbooks would probably discuss a particular period in, uh, in the past, for example, say the modern period or the Gupta period, and at the end they would have a paragraph entitled Social and Cultural Conditions, where uh, they will be given information on the kind of jewelry that women wore in the past or the kind of clothes they wore, as to, which gives them the impression that, uh, you know, all through history women were just getting up in the morning and obsessing about what to wear, uh, whereas the men went out and did the actual work of, uh, you know, founding kingdoms and, um, you know, making laws and building structures and so on and so forth. But um, uh, I'm a gender historian and I look at, you know, inscriptions, coins and texts and actual sources of history. And in the period that I'm looking at, women were either on the throne as formal rulers or uh, ruling behind the throne as advisors. There were court participants, dynasty makers and destroyers, mediators, builders, donors. And so hugely important in every sphere of life. So I wanted to convey that fact to the students and what alarmed me uh, you know, even more is when I actually um, asked students in various schools about whether women existed in the Indus Valley civilization times, in the Harappan civilization, 99% of the time they would say no. It's an instinctive reaction because that is the kind of history they're taught. So then I tell them, okay, stop and think about it. You know, do you think women didn't exist? And then they would say, um, oh my goodness, yeah, they would have existed, but how come we don't hear about them or read about them? So that's why I thought Didda's story deserved to be told. Also because I think uh, Kashmir is not really covered in the history textbooks that the children read. They read very little about Kashmir. And also she is one of the women uh, whom, uh, you know, whose story deserves to be told. It should be known to, you know, uh, to students as a part of their historical heritage, which is why I wrote the book. Um, yes, Didda was every bit the way I have portrayed her. Um, she's neither black or white, but has definite shades of grey, like all of us. Um, how difficult is it to fictionalize history? It's, it's you know, um, it's Didda's, uh, the facts about Didda, it took me around, you know, four to five years to accumulate. And then you have so many facts at your disposal, but then you have to condense it into a 40,000 word book. And plus, uh, you need to make it readable so that students don't run further away from history than they're already doing at the moment because um, it is one of the subjects that they dread most in school. They find it mind-numbingly boring. And so um, the challenge before me is to make sure I don't add to that impression and to you know, make them know that history can be interesting. So it's just the challenge of knowing which facts to retain, which to discard and make the whole narrative readable. Um, there is, of course, another challenge that I think a lot of children's writers face, particularly they're writing for the young adult age group in India, uh, which is that they have to go past the gatekeepers, which uh, who are the parents and the librarians who decide what is appropriate for children to read. Um, in fact, uh, in a lot of schools that I've gone to, uh, some librarians without even reading the book have said, no, but does it have violence? And so that is something that I have to be very clear about that, yes, of course, the book has violence, but this is a fact of history. You cannot wish it away. So while you can give the child access to potentially disturbing uh, aspects in social media and on TV, you know, 
the the hysteria builds up more when it's a book you know is it appropriate is, is it not so I think that um, that's also one of the challenges that you have to face you have to you know convince people that it is readable that a younger art is going to enjoy this book is going to learn about a part of the past that he or she deserves to know about so that's also one of the challenges that come about when you're writing history. Um, yeah, when this book won the Neve Young Adult Book Award, I wasn't really expecting it. I just enjoyed writing the story enormously and I didn't really consider about whether it would uh, garner any accolades after that. But it was, um, it was an endorsement of what I do and uh, it was very, very uh, gratifying and thrilling to win the award. The rights of this book have also been sold to a movie production house, so uh, Queen of Ice will be a movie soon. Um, I'm thrilled about it, but it's also a little bit like throwing your baby out into the wild. So you've, uh, you feel protective about, you know, her story. But then after all, the story is not exclusively mine. It belongs to, uh, you know, everybody who reads about her. So I'm excited in, about uh, where the story is going, I mean, it's going places. So I'm excited to see what the movie will be all about and whether they actually the production house is able to depict the, the story in the way uh, it should be depicted. I think uh, in most school sessions that I've done, the fact that such a woman uh, existed and could exercise such power comes as a revelation to most of the students because, as I said before, they are taught to um, treat women as trivial parts of history who's, you know, who need not necessarily be a part of the mainstream narrative so um, and they I think they also relate a lot to her uh, to her the way I've portrayed her as in as I portrayed her I told you before in shades of grey so she's actually very relatable uh, because all of us have shades of good and evil in us and which side we choose to uh, suppress and which we choose to like um, let forth is, is a battle that we all face so I think they find Diddha's character very very relatable and they also it's also a lot of them have grudgingly told me after reading their book that they, they might need to revise their view of history that it need not necessarily be um, as terribly boring as they have been <laughs> you know <laughs> they have conditioned themselves to feel a lot of them have asked me why Diddha is not part of their course and why they can't actually study this book as part of their history course, which of course, it would be delightful if history was taught just in terms of historical fiction, but unfortunately, you know, that's not the way our textbooks are written. But um, this book has been picked up as a supplementary reader by some schools, so they, you know, it is being read. And so I've been quite encouraged by the reception that it's received, you know, from its readers. So it just encouraged me to write more books of this kind. I think uh, teachers and librarians could use this book as a resource while teaching history or while trying to inculcate uh, an interest in the subject. Um, you could use Queen of Eyes as a starting point of a debate about women in history. Um, I mean, uh, maybe you could even uh, use the book to problematize uh, the ways in which women are depicted and, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis reality. And uh, the fact is that uh, of course, it's not, it's not easy. It's not as if just because you use this book as a resource and you say, okay, so there was this woman, now go and find the others. It's not like a treasure hunt. You probably um, will not be able to find too much information, particularly on women in the ancient period and the early medieval period because the sources just don't exist or they're badly preserved. But the very fact that you could pose this as a question about whether we, uh, you know, the students are getting to read a complete picture about any period of history that they are dealing with, is a, is a starting point. I mean, it's a big change. So, you know, if students get used to trying to add women into the picture and integrate them into the narrative, that is that, I mean, I will feel happy if my book has actually been conducive towards this change. So um, I think that, uh, and of course, and just, just to read it as not, read this book, it will teach you about history. Just read this book because it's interesting and you'll get to know about a remarkable character and uh, just, you know, uh, you will 
find that her uh, story is really gripping and uh, maybe you, that would encourage you to read more books of this kind, something like that. Uh, so Queen of Ice is written in two voices, one is the voice of Didda and the other is the voice of Valga who is a woman who used to carry Didda around from place to place because Didda was lame. So uh, the extract that I am going to read is the uh, point where both of them meet for the first time and what happens there. I step around the bend in the bank and come upon a strange sight. This is Valga's voice. Princess Didda is sprawled in an ungainly manner on the ground and struggling to get to her feet crying in rage. Yet her short portly cousin, the one they call Prince Vigraha, knocks her down whenever she manages to raise herself. The ground is wet and sticky with mud and her clothes are soiled with it. I look around for help but there is no one in sight. We are completely alone. Anger flares in my mind and before I quite know what I am doing, I rush across and knock the boy off his feet. He falls to the ground with an outraged shout but springs up at once and races at me. He is surprisingly swift despite his bulk. I try to run but he grabs my cloak and whips me around to face him so sharply that my neck throbs with pain. Then he slaps me across my cheek and punches me in, my, in the chest. How dare you, he screams, his fists clenched, his thick eyebrows meeting above his eyes in one straight line. How dare you touch me, you ugly, low-caste, filthy servant, you. He doesn't complete the sentence because I have punched him back in the chest and he collapses with a groan and falls silent. I hold a hand out to the princess and more or less haul her to her feet. She stands leaning heavily on me and panting as if she has run for miles. Then she says, I thank you whoever you are. In a minute he would have thrown me into the water and then I wouldn't have known what to do. She does not ask me, uh, can't you swim Princess Didda? I ask without thinking and then wish I could bite out my tongue for I have suddenly remembered she is lame. My face grows red and I stammer, I am sorry, that was stupid of me. She does not ask me how I know her name or her disability. All of a sudden, I find her steering me towards the stream, still leaning on me for support. We gaze down into the water, the unruffled surface reflecting our solemn faces faithfully, her big black eyes staring at mine, her long black hair swinging like a rope. We stand there for a while trying to get back our breath, but we have grown careless, for I hear a twig snap behind us. Then I whirl around and Prince Vigraha is right behind, advancing menacingly with the clear intention of pushing us into the stream. Panic seizes me, the princess can't swim and I would be weighed down in the water if she sank and dragged me with her, unless. In a swift fluid movement, I gra grasp the princess around her waist, hoist her onto my shoulders and enter the stream just out of reach of the princess's long fingers. The water is cold despite it being summer and the shock makes me gasp. But then I steady myself and begin to strike out for the other side, the princess clinging onto my head for dear life. Within a couple of minutes, we are safe on the other bank with the prince dancing in frustration on the opposite side. Even before I lay her gently on the ground, Princess Didda is laughing as if she'll never stop. Great deep chuckles that shake her body and bring tears to her eyes. How did you do that, my dear friend, she asks. Once her laughter has worked its way out of her. I am torn between pride and fear. I have managed to rescue a princess, but the look on her cousin's face tells me he will not forgive or forget. I am strong, I say simply, and I didn't know how else to stop him. Your name, she asks, suddenly thoughtful. Valga, I say. You live here, Valga? My aunt is your seamstress, I reply. I live with her. Tell your aunt that you have a new job from today, she says. Will you do that? My breath quickens. New job? What does the princess mean? You will carry me around Valga, she says confidently, as if she knows I won't argue with her. You will be with me at all times to make sure that my limp doesn't hinder me. Will you do that for me, Valga? <laughs> 